it is 530. So I am going to call the meeting to order and uh, ask for a motion uh, mm -hmm. to call the October 22nd Hadley School Committee Public Schools uh, meeting to order. Is there a motion? Motion to call Second. the school committee to order. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 Great. And I see we've got a number of participants on. So thank you for joining us. We love seeing everybody come out to these meetings. And we are um, going to move right through the agenda to respect everybody's time here. Um, adjustments to the agenda, I believe we have two. Um, one is an announcement about the LPAC uh, meeting. And uh, we'll add that to the top of the presentation and discussion items. And the second is um, an, a, a new topic of the CDC guidance on close contact. So I think we can couple that with the preparation for progressing into the next phase and talk about it in terms of what that means, um, these new CDC guidance uh, that just came out. Um, any other adjustments for today? No. No. Right. Great. With that, we will then move into public comment. If you, uh, just as a reminder, uh, public comment in this electronic format, we would ask that you raise your digital hand. Uh, you should see it in the uh, Zoom uh, meeting pane under, I uh, believe it's under participants, or there may be a raised hand at the bottom, depending on the platform that you're using. If I see a digital hand, I will call on you and open comment. Uh, public comment is three minutes. Um, and we ask that folks be uh, respectful of the time. Uh, and I will just pause here to see if we have any volunteers for public comment. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move right then into the presentations and discussion items. Uh, Annie, would you like to make the announcement about the LPAC meeting real quick? Yes, please. So we are thrilled. Uh, yes, last year we were working on this and then um, uh, we didn't have our spring meeting because of COVID. So Hadley Public Schools is organizing its Eng English Language Learner Parent Advisory Council. The first meeting uh, will be next Tuesday via Zoom. Uh, and that will be at three in the afternoon. These times will change. Some of our families of elves work first shift, some work second shift, some work third shift, some work multiple shifts. But our first meeting is Tuesday. Um, and we'll also uh, make sure that information's already out to families and um, just excited to, to get it off the ground. That's great, exciting news. Okay. Uh, let's move into the review of public health data. Do you want sure. to share your screen? Yeah, I will share my screen. And Heather, can you take care of admitting folks when I, I do, that? do that? I yep. do that. Thank you. Hi, Jen. Um, okay, just give me one second here, folks, and I'll get it up. Why every week this feels like a mystery? We don't know. Okay. There we go. All right. So what we are seeing this week in the public uh, health data, these data are now being published on Thursdays rather than on Wednesdays. Previously, they were on Wednesday, now they're on Thursdays. Um, and the case count data for positive cases in schools and districts is published on Thursdays, but a bit later. The data for case count and average daily incidence rate will be published Thursdays by 4 p.m. And the Department of Elementary and Secondary case data will be published later on Thursday evening. So what we see from last week to this week is an increase from 52 to 53 total case count in Hadley. Case count over the last 14 days has remained under five. The average daily incidence rate has decreased from 5.5, it was 5.5 for two weeks in a row and decreased to 3.6. And the testing positivity rate for Hampshire County has decreased from 0.33% to 0.23%. And I remind everybody that this is in a public folder. It's uh, included in the superintendent's weekly email every week. And uh, that folder with these data is again, available to the public uh, at any time. The district data has, 
I don't have an update from uh, last week, right before school committee, it had not yet been published. If it's published tonight, I'll have this updated by tomorrow. There are no uh, positive cases that have been reported in Hadley Public School District. Thanks, so, Anna. Andy, I know we were tracking a couple other schools, right? Frontier and where, correct? Because they, they've gone back to a full, not a cohort model, they're back full in person. They're not, 100% of students are not on campus. So they are in hybrid, they don't have 100% on. But the reason that I include some districts that are outliers, so not in Hampshire County, Athol, Frontier, Ware, I include those districts, and soon Granby. Granby will be welcoming more students back in person. Right now they have very few students in special populations next week. They'll be welcoming many more students back in person. And those schools are, I checked with the superintendents again, their high school students are going through their regular schedule. So the groups are mixing at the high school. Um, again, these data from these weeks here, I don't know how many children they have had in, but yes, I included them so we could pay attention to uh, what happens in those districts because they are not keeping their high school students in a cohort. Okay. So we looked at these last week and the data um, actually are on a slightly downward trend, it looks like since last week, at least from the graph and from the average daily incidence rate is going down. Um, so I think the dialogue for us is, uh, is there any reason from this data to revisit our decision from last week to move forward? This was kind of added as a cautionary review this week to be sure that if anything, you know, um, changed, the picture changed this week, that we would be able to revisit the decision for Monday. Um, but I, I see no reason to revisit it based off of this data. What do you all think? Uh, Annie, do you mind um, zooming out so that um, viewers can see the last, um, the last chart? Sure. It just, it looks, uh, yeah, it's, un uh, it's the green line chart. Sure. They just can't, People can't see the end of it. Yeah, exactly. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think this um, is consistent with um, what we said last week, which is that we set metrics, we are under those metrics, um, and there's nothing here that um, is concerning that we're going in a, a negative trend. Um, I agree. The only thing I didn't um, notice, and it's, it, it doesn't affect my opinion that I still feel the same as last week and that it's appropriate to move forward, but I, when I looked at the weekly report today, and I haven't really read through to completely dissect it, to understand why they're using the asterisks there, I, I understand that they're breaking it down by saying that there's a municipality that has, you know, um, a certain number of caseload in either a nursing home or um, an institution or whatnot. But I didn't understand, I didn't read to see if that impacted the numbers. And that's why, say, for instance, Amherst went from red to yellow. If they've changed the way they're looking at that data, I don't know if you looked at that yet, Annie, or anybody else. But so I can answer, I think, that for you, and it's something that um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, which we just received today, came out with. So I think this will answer your question. Um, so risk level color in this report, I'm sorry, I'm reading it from my desktop at work. Mm -hmm. Risk level color will be identified with an asterisk if one of these identified institutions, identified institutions all are long-term care facility, higher education institution, or correctional facility. If one of those in identified institutions has more than 10 cases and results in 30% of the total cases for a municipality over the last 14 days, that asterisk is designed to tell the community that. This is a conversation that you folks had as you were establishing metrics is how do we tease out the effect of UMass? How do we tease out the effect 
of a congregate care facility, uh, an institution. And um, apparently this is an issue for many communities, right? Um, and that's why they added that asterisk. So to your understanding, the numbers are still the numbers in total counts, but the numbers just... are still the numbers. If 10 okay. of those cases, if 10 of the cases are associated with one of those facilities right. and that results in 30% of total cases, okay, then that's what the asterisk is telling you. The okay. numbers are still the numbers, but the extent to which are they 10%, are they 10 cases in one of those facilities? And does it then constitute 30% of total cases? Right. So you can better kind of isolate outbreaks in congregate care facilities and higher education campuses and incarceration. I mean, that's not about congregate care, but you know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. So they, they, what they're saying is that it's asterisked if a municipality's positive cases have been significantly impacted by a clearly identified cluster. Mm -hmm. And they give examples of like long-term care facility, higher education institution, or a correctional facility. And, and you're right. I think this is exactly what we were talking about um, back in August, that we wanted the kind of, you know, the info beneath the numbers. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say is that I think it's good that they're finding a way to differentiate that to try to, I guess, ease um, community members. But at the same time, when we look at it, I think we should still just pay attention because um, a long term care facility and um, a place of incarceration are very confined, whereas a place like UMass, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, secondary educational, it's, it's not confined. So it is helpful, but I, I think it's important to keep it in mind that the people at an institution are able to go about and travel and um, visit places at their will, whereas the other two sites that they've identified are, are much more restrictive. Just thoughts. It doesn't change my perspective right now. Just thoughts mm -hmm. to keep in mind. Yeah, I agree. So I think, um, you know, we're committed to having this weekly dashboard be updated every week um, mm -hmm. and reviewing the data, not only as part of our meeting here, um, our regularly scheduled meetings, but I think we'll be uh, transparent and have it available for folks on that weekly basis uh, and just kind of accumulate the data as we go. Uh, and we reserve the right to meet in the interim should there be something that warrants um, immediate attention. Hey, so this is just to chime in. I, 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 I agree that I think we're on path to, to open up or just a comment on the, the numbers. I'm encouraged by the fact that it's gone down and gone down in the county. Um, I mean, all of us expect to see increases again. And, you know, I was surprised that UMass went so long without some sort of outbreak. What I'm encouraged by is how quickly they responded and how quickly the numbers went back, back down. They've done over 100,000 tests so far, right? And so I think they're, they're doing the best they can. So that's encouraging to me because we know things will happen into the future until we have a vaccine. So, um, and I would like to, in that same vein, just talk about, well, what is, maybe this is the next discussion is what does that not only in the next phase look like which i know we're starting on monday but what's the phase after that look like and that's what i'd like to talk about if we have time is what's the second or i guess it'd be the third phase look like i can i can address a bit of that i certainly am happy to um include uh that on future agendas like on the november 5th agenda i know that the faculty particularly, I think this is a really pressing question at Hopkins Academy because the experience of the students at Hopkins Academy is qualitatively and significantly different than what it has been in the past. And the faculty at Hopkins and the administration at Hopkins have been talking about how they might um, introduce the regular schedule at what rate, what would be required to do that, and what are the implications of doing that in terms of physical distancing and just what are the implications for that. I can tell you that in terms of this upcoming phase, it would be, I just want the community to be very clear that it would, we need six weeks in the next phase. And I know that is hard for people to hear 
And here's the reason why that any sort of change requires a degree of preparation. And especially if we decide that, all right, actually we could, we could allow children greater access if we're watching other districts and we say it makes sense perhaps to allow children greater access to their regular schedule and not just remotely. We need to be able to plan for that. We need to be able to make sure that all classrooms are organized in a way and set up in a way that makes sure that we're adhering to the other parts of our plan. And we need to be able to tell the community if um, doing that would require a significant change to the plans. I also, from my perspective, just want to underscore that I am so pleased with the data in our schools and district. One of the, I'm gonna remind people that when, when the school committee was deliberating over an incredibly serious and agonizing decision about what to do in phase one, people were extremely nervous and downright afraid of what reopening schools meant for the health and safety of the community and for the children in schools and the faculty and staff understandably afraid and nervous. And there was no way to know with any degree of certainty what precisely would happen when schools were reopened. We trusted the guidance that we were given. We trusted the doctors and their recommendations, but I would be lying if I said that we knew for certain what was going to happen. Our faculty and staff, I believe that one of the primary reasons that we have not seen school transmission is because our faculty and staff, the people closest to the learners, implement our reopening plan and mitigation strategies with fidelity. And we're getting great results. And I just don't want to rush in and say, because things are going so well, and I know that's not what you're suggesting, Paul, but I want the community to hear me say this, I, I would, rather move with a degree of caution than rush in um, because we have such great results now. I mean, I'm oversimplifying when I say this, but I always say to me, that is the Israel example, right? So Israel opened schools, had mitigation strategies in place, and then really quickly started loosening some of those up and ended up almost, I don't wanna say nationwide shutdown, but with many schools shut down again. Um, so Certainly in this next phase of phase two, we wanna monitor closely what's happening in other districts. I wanna give the faculty and administration time to work through the many ideas that they've had about how to qualitatively improve the experience that students are having and, and the faculty is having. I mean, no faculty member applied for a job in a virtual district. Our faculty applied to work in a district where we deliver instruction in person. So um, also uh, giving the faculty a chance to weigh in on what makes sense in terms of teaching and learning. So, but I certainly think 11-5, that meeting, we will have almost two weeks in, in the second phase. And I think it makes sense to then revisit that topic. And I'll be talking with administrators and teachers and the school nurses about what's happening and what might make sense. Andy. Andy, this, this is Paul, this is great. So your thought is on the fifth, we would what? We would deliberate what those next phases look like again? Because right, we have a plan now, but right. it sounds like folks are coming up with different ideas. So those different ideas will be presented and discussed? Well, I'm, I'm not promising you that there's going to be a big presentation PowerPoints. I say every time we meet, I can update you. I mean, maybe there would be a presentation, but I'm not, I'm not implying that at this point. I'm saying people, they're going to focus on Monday the 26th on implementing every mitigation strategy with fidelity since many more children are returning. That is their primary laser-like focus on that, right? Um, but I'm telling you that Hopkins has, or telling everyone that Hopkins administration and faculty have been talking about this. They've surveyed students. Um, Ms. Camuso has talked at length with faculty. So they are thinking of ideas, whatever ideas they have, if they're ready for a kind of public discussion, perhaps we'd be discussing those. At a minimum, let's monitor what is happening. And I can get exact numbers, how many students are on those campuses 
where they're uh, the, where they don't have cohorts in high school. So how many students are on those campuses? How many students are we talking about? How many classes are they running through in their block schedule on a given day? And we can monitor the results there, um, and then and then talk about what makes sense. And also in terms of of length of phases, I think that that would require communication between um, educators and the school committee, um, uh, if it's a substantial change to the plan. And um, I think that we, we want to make sure that we hear from DPH and from others. And I did email uh, Dr. Allen from the Chan School to ask him if, in fact, he was the individual that suggested that we adopt six week phases. So I did follow up with him this week based on parent feedback. I emailed him and, and asked him to um, reach back out to me so we could talk about that. I have not heard from him. I'm sure that I will. Um, he's, he's very responsive. So that's what I see happening on the fifth is, is let's see what's happening in these other districts. If we have ideas to share, if I have ideas to share with you from the faculty or if Ms. Camuso wanted to share ideas about some things they might be considering, we could do that. And certainly I would have an update at that point from um, Dr. Allen. So um, the next phase, assuming, you know, all goes well with this, this phase two, which starts on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. Phase three, whatever that may look like would start December 7th. That I believe that's the six week mark. So what it sounds like is we have a number of opportunities between now and then to have input from uh, the faculty, from uh, your administration, and uh, bring that forward to the multiple school committee meetings that we have to discuss whether either a future phase looks different or we're skipping over a phase is kind of what I, I think we're saying. Is that true? I would be careful about just, I, I think I hear what you're saying. I'd be careful about the language of skipping over a phase. Um, I think that, I think the primary question we're trying to, I think what's on people's minds around this question is, is there a way to do something different for the high school and middle school students, right? Right. In and terms of their schedule and their experience. Live, live instruction, direct right. delivery. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so I would put it this way, that way. We're trying to answer that question. We're looking at that, we're coming up with ideas. What are the options and what are the implications for those options, right? In order to get this, does it require giving something else up? Does it require a different adjustment? And then thinking through, and what are the implications of that adjustment? And we, we keep learning as we go, right? We keep learning new things like what a close contact is or we learn things as we go. Um, so I think that's the question we're trying to answer. I just don't want the larger community to hear, um, which no one is saying that we are trying to race through or that we would skip things or that good so far. So let's just, woo, we're good. And no one is saying that. Just want to so Annie, I, 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 between moving too slowly and rushing is moving deliberately. And that's what I hear you calling for, which is good. But part of moving deliberately is having a plan. And so that's mm -hmm. the only thing that gives me concern about what you said is knowing how this body would need to meet, discuss, meet again, discuss. I just want to be thoughtful about timelines here. Quickly, we'll find ourselves in January, you know, on the second half of you know, this year. I guess I would like more clarity on what can be done by when. And I understand teachers are focused on the 26th. It's a big switch. So I'm not saying we need to make commitments anytime in the next week or so, but is there anything we can do also to help to flesh out when would we have some better ideas on that? Because there are going to be, there, that's our next discussion is if you have, say, Frontier, Athol, and Ware, keep on those trends, right? How, are there lessons we can learn from them? Of course, we're going to have people saying, why don't we do what they're doing? Because they're doing it to good effect. And so what is our answer to that? And what's our plan to do that? And it sounds like you all are thinking about that. But if we can't have a fleshed out discussion or you don't want to commit to a fleshed out discussion on the 5th of November, when can we have that discussion? I think it's reasonable to say we'd have that discussion on 1119. And that just means to have a fleshed out discussion. I just know realistically that any, any 
major reconsiderations. Uh, one, especially if we're talking about the high school schedule, that absolutely requires our Hopkins Academy middle and high school schedule. That absolutely requires input from the faculty and the administration, the students, and again, all these folks are doing that. And I just know maybe they could turn around and have some major, here's all of our ideas by the fifth. Um, but next week is a really big deal. This, the district is working really hard. The elementary school is the largest influx of students. They are working like mad. So I just, all I'm saying is the fifth, I really wanna be respectful of that. I want them to continue to just be focused on implementing the phase they're entering well, which they will, because the way in which they implemented phase one, we right now for this moment have zero cases. I mean, that's, that's certainly worthy of a deep breath and a great job, HBS faculty and staff. And so I think by 1119, um, it would be reasonable to say, here are some of the things that are under consideration. This is why, and this is what we're learning from the districts around us. By the fifth, I can certainly ask, I will have some data that, that paints a more complete picture. On the fifth, I will ask my colleagues, tell me precisely how many students you have in your high schools. Tell me how many classes they're going to. Tell me the length of the blocks. I can get some of that data too. Just to help people make more sense of what they're seeing in those districts where students are moving through classes. Andy, that, that timeline sounds fair to me. I understand you have a lot, of, you all have a lot on your plate. One thing though that it's still not clear on, do you mm -hmm. ever see the school administration coming forward with a proposal if they think a change to the phased approach is warranted? See that if, the, if the faculty and administration felt like there was something that required revision or revisiting, yeah, absolutely. I would see the faculty and administration. And that would also always include, just like in the original development, input from students, particularly at Hopkins Academy, um, as well as input from parents, but certainly and certainly at the high school level. The students have already been invited to weigh in on some ideas that Ms. Camuso has sent out um, and we'll continue to do that. So potentially, yes. I mean, the short answer is yes, I could see that. So maybe we can talk on the fifth when we have more information about how you might think through what's what would warrant a recommended change. Is it poor attendance by students? Is it still dis, you know, students being disconnected? Because that's the kind of thing I'd be, I'd want to hear from you all. Okay. Um, so I would say on the fifth, that's helpful. Data on uh, additional data on the schools that are running a regular schedule. Um, we, I got to write this down. Schools running regular schedule. Or no, I don't. This is being recorded. Additional data on schools. <laughs> I have to write anything down. Additional data on schools uh, who are running a regular schedule. And um, the criteria data, um, qualitative and quantitative, that would cause us to reconsider the current recommend the current how instruction is organized at the, how the schedule is organized at the high school, I should say. Yeah, and how that's affecting uh, pedagogy, how that's affecting teachers and students. I mean, I know I have a high school student who's wondering whether he should go back if all he's mm -hmm. going to do is sit in a room on a computer. And, you know, I can see his, I can see the dilemma. If we were going back now as a frontier and Athol or where, it wouldn't be a question. He'd want to go back. Um, and so if they're doing it to success, why can't we? What, why are we different? Are the numbers different? Um, and then also, um, what are the lessons they might learn? Or, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all the students will go back and they're okay with cohorting and, and it works well. So by the fifth, like you say, we'll have some insights. Definitely by the 19th, we'll have more. Yeah. Well, it sounds like on the test too, we'll have a better idea of the count, right, of number of students that are, are back versus staying at home. We will have that information, absolutely. Who is present, who isn't present, and... Um, and I think it is really important to have that context of, of how many students are running through schedules in these schools and when did they start doing that, right? So we, 
put together our initial our initial cohort plan, and I, I do I absolutely empathize with and understand the aggravation for high school students. This is not what high school should feel like. I understand that, and I wish I could make it different like that. And when we were creating these plans, our primary objective was how do we reduce risk, minimize the likelihood of schools contributing to community transmission or community transmission causing an outbreak in schools. So how do we keep people safe and healthy and give them access and try to control for these things? And that, and so every measure we could take and cohorts was one of those measures. Um, and now we'll just pay attention to what's happening around us. And if there's something that um, we can continue to get the same impact, the same effect through hand washing, mask wearing, frequent uh, cleaning of uh, frequently touched surfaces and physical distancing. Um, but I just, to your point, Paul, I just wanna make sure that we are, we are deliberate. Um, thank goodness. Thank goodness we're having the outcomes right now that we are, um, and that's wonderful, and it's amazing. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to disrupt that. I just before we move on, I I want to say a few things. Um, I think I, I'm glad to hear that administration and teachers and everybody is thinking and planning ahead because I think this is going to take a lot of thought and coordination to get that moving. And I'm I'm. I, I agree with you, Annie. I'm, I'm, I'm really hesitant to have a really um, concrete conversation on the fifth. That's only a week and a half into yeah. phase one when we're gonna have a lot more students back on um, the schools. Um, and then really, you know, I think it's great to be monitoring um, these other districts that are, that are not cohorting or doing the regular, um, their regular, you know, high school schedule and whatnot. And I think it would be great for Hopkins to be able to get back there as well. but you know, when you look at that, we, you know, we've kind of said we're looking at, you know, virus cycles for starters. So at least that three weeks, which the 19th would at least have us one virus cycle. Um, but really looking at, you know, we're only looking at the data in Hampshire County. So when we think about where or Athol, I, I don't, I gotta say, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even know which county they're in, but looking at the community data for those counties, because what we've, st in my opinion, what we still want to be mindful of is that if we know that children are less impacted by the virus in general, and there are so many people that are asymptomatic, I just want to be careful that we're monitoring the community as a whole as well to make sure that we're not becoming like an asymptomatic spreader to the community. Mm -hmm. So still watching the county data. And I mean, maybe even we pay just a little bit of an eye on, on those counties as well, if we're gonna look at those school districts. And I'm not saying that we're gonna close down because of those counties numbers, but keeping an eye on and correlating some of that. And my other question, do we know just, I know you'll have a better idea on the fifth, but do we have a general idea of how many students are coming back? Like what percent increase that is gonna be next week as students coming back? So I can't do the percent increase off the top of my head, but you're looking at an increase. Um, you're looking at coming up to roughly a total of about 200 students at Hadley Elementary School. Um, so, uh, and you know, Jen can probably rattle it off the top of her head. So let me jump in on Hopkins because I don't have April here. I think that I just saw April's email today. So Tara, I think uh, they are up to just under an increase of. I think an increase of 70. I can look that up while Jen tells you who's coming back to HES. Yeah, we just we have just shy under uh, 200 students that are going to be in person, roughly bringing back about 100, um, 112, I believe. Um, so that's what we're planning for. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to the families that allowed us to have the two days today um, and tomorrow in planning for Monday. Uh, there was a lot of things that we had to work out, um, schedules, making sure that our schedules are tight with opportunities for still our remote learners. We have approximately 48 children that will be um, accessing um, our curriculum remotely. So they'll continue to do so. So we just wanted to be mindful about what kind of schedule they might have. I'm doing a parent uh, 
uh, Q&A tomorrow at 10 from 10 to 11. I emailed out uh, a Zoom link for that, as well as a Google Doc where families could submit questions. It will be recorded. So responses to um, any questions that families wanted to put in, if they weren't able to make it, it will be recorded and uploaded onto the website later on for viewing. Um, so we're, we're planning ahead, we're doing the best we can as far as making sure that all of our health and safety protocols are really tight to give um, just the children an opportunity to practice being in the building for the first time since March. Um, some of these students have not come back. Um, briefly, we had our assessments. So we encouraged families to come in and have our students be assessed in the gym. That was an overall great success. And the teachers were really, really excited to be able to see their students in person for the first time. Um, and that went extremely well. We collected a lot of data and we're happy to be um, looking at that in the next couple of weeks to see what kind of gaps um, there are that we need to um, be targeted with instruction and interventions and just overall to see how the students are performing. Um, and so that's going to be set for, for Monday. Um, we're redoing, I also have to thank the um, Hadley uh, Fire Department who came over. Um, Chief Spank Nabel worked with me on reworking our um, dismissal and arrival so that we'll have additional lanes um, so that our flow of traffic will be a little bit better. We're trying to add additional spaces for students to keep them separate, um, but making sure that our arrival and our dismissal procedures um, are going to work better. And I'm, I'm grateful to work in a town where I can call the, the chief and he can come over and help me plan everything out. Those lines of traffic will be laid out over the weekend um, with uh, with some help from from um, Department of Public Works. And so we're excited to be able to get all that ready for Monday morning. So that's just a brief update. Thank you, Jen. And thank you for buying me time on finding the answer to Hawkins. That was very no helpful. Problem. And uh, 89, 89 students are returning to Hawkins on Monday. 89 so students are coming in. So there's a good amount of students, especially in the elementary school, and I know the two schools look different, but there's a big influx of students. So this is, well, we're not starting over at square one, we're kind of starting over to some extent. And so what I'd be curious to hear, um, you know, a week and a half into having a lot more students back is even informal feedback from teachers on how that's going as far as, you know, being able to keep younger students safely socially distant, how they're able to still learn in that environment. Does that make it much more distracting? Is it, you know, just kind of like how it's working out? Because the feedback we've gotten so far is that it's working well, right? But there's, there's still such a small amount of students there that this is going to more than double the amount of kids that are there. So I'm just curious, I'd be curious, just informal feedback from teachers. And if from the high school, there's feedback from even students that teachers have heard, you know, how it's going on their end. Certainly, I can uh, make sure that for 11.5, I get some of that information and make sure that it's available. Andy, what is, so what is that total number at Hopkins right now? Uh, because we had several students, we had far fewer students in remote, at, in the in-person in phase one. Uh, so you're looking at, it looks like if I did my count right, uh, around 125. Um, but I was quickly adding up. It wasn't on an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, thanks. I, I, I just was going to say, I know, Paul, kind of to try and, I, the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about how do we, how do we start having the conversation about a, a change to the phases is getting the kids in the building. And I think this is kind of that first step, that necessary step. Um, and, and getting more kids into Hopkins is going to give us a better sense of how the school day flows, how how everybody interacts. And I think if we can see that that moves in the right direction, then we can certainly have that conversation. But um, I think we need to we need to see it play out and, and give teachers and, and students the opportunity to kind of navigate that for a couple of weeks before we before we can can realistically say, all right, now we need to to change or we can we can think about changing because I, I think it is important to pay attention to what's happening at other schools and in other communities. But let's let's see it work in our community as well. As it has you said that, uh, Ethan, I just want to say that because uh, that's an important point. This transitioning to phases is, um, and 
faculty, they, they don't complain at all. They just do. And uh, they execute and they execute well. Um, but it's a lot, right? So to your point, Ethan, it's, it is now teachers are going to say a new group of students needs to learn routines and even, even older students. I mean, goodness, look at UMass. I would say sometimes, sometimes we can get younger children to adhere to the expectations around some things than, than older children. So at any grade level, it's a lot, if it's simultaneous, wow, I'm getting a whole bunch of children and we're doing something different and kids are mixing. And that's, that's a lot, right? To try to manage and make sure that things are, we're executing our mitigation strategies with fidelity. So it is helpful. I am grateful that there are families, even though students, even though it is not what they expect, um, not what they want in this moment, for the very reason that you just articulated, Ethan, I am extremely grateful for those folks who are, who are going to report to Hopkins because it does allow us to understand what changes, does anything change in terms of the data when we have more people present? Yeah, because I, I mean, I, and I'll just finish up. I think I assume that if we went to a, a, a schedule that looked a lot more like uh, what, what high school looked like prior to uh, COVID, that there'd be a higher percentage of kids that would want to return or families that would want to return. And, and I think that's great, but I also, you know, I, I think it's important for us to get the, the numbers in the building first, even if it isn't the most exciting high school experience, because I think if we get the numbers in the building and we see that success that I think, um, I think everybody would feel a little bit better about moving forward. And to tack on to Ethan real quick, just so that I understand as we're kind of playing out the high school, 127 will be back in person is what we're estimating. Out of how many kids total do we have in Hopkins? Roughly 250 at each campus. Just give 250 at each campus. Okay, so then if you're having 127 back and now we think about, okay, we're going to, for phase three, change it. We're no longer cohorting and now everyone comes back. Now, again, you're doubling your number of students coming back onto campus and completely changing things around. So I think that's something we do need to watch a little closely. Just want to add that um, I think the success that we've seen is directly a result of the um, exorbitant amount of time, Annie, you and your team put into development of the plan. And I just remember hours of painstaking review of that plan. And the, I really appreciate the fidelity with which you and the staff have um, executed on that plan, really learned from it and um, I can't underscore enough just how important it is to be cautious in this uh, and and not um, you know this is this is where stakes are really high so um, I appreciate that as you look at any change in plan that you'll put the same degree of um, care and study into the development of that, as will we as a school committee in the analysis of that. So thank you. You're welcome. And it really, I'm just going to say again, I'm not being falsely self-deprecating. I did work my tail off over the summer. I didn't do it alone. But now this is going well because of the faculty and staff. It's not going well because of me. It's going well because of the faculty and staff. And families who have uh, helped their children to understand the reason we're doing these things. Right, so students are participating. I have to give them the credit too. Students are participating and I'm quite certain that is with the encouragement and help of their parents. So thank you everybody because we all just want to stay healthy and safe. And I trust your leadership in taking us down the path that we need to go down when we need to go down that path. Thanks. So just one thought too. I think it is important to understand how many people and seats, children and seats we have there. Just. I still think it's suboptimal, the cohorting, right? Mm -hmm. The closer we can get to the traditional classes, I think the better it is for everybody. Um, and so, yes, we need to be cautious. We need to be deliberate. We don't need to rush, Annie, as you've been saying. Um, I just think we know we're a lot smarter now than we were months ago when we put together that plan. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's our responsibility to adaptively manage based on the best available information and, and the experience. And there will be risk. There's always risk. And we're going to have to make that risk decision wisely. And I think we're just a heck of a lot smarter. And we will be smarter on the fifth. And I just want to make sure that we've got a plan for how we're going to talk about this. Because as you just could hear in the tones of people, there's different risk tolerances here. Yeah. 
And I think we still have a lot of parents, and I would argue a majority of the parents that want their children back in school, operating as close to normal as we can under safe conditions. And so I think we're gonna need time to, to weigh that out. And just because a student goes to class does not mean it's optimal for them. And some students are not gonna go because they think it's gonna be suboptimal. Mm -hmm. And I wish they would go, because I think it is gonna be better to have more people in, even if they are still cohorting. But I know that's a tough decision, especially mm -hmm. for teenagers who like to roll out of bed and hang out in their pajamas all day. So not saying I have any direct experience with that, but I've, I've heard stories. So uh, I think I think I look forward to the conversation on the fifth. I don't want to put any unnecessary undue pressure onto the, yeah. the teachers because I know they're busy, but if there's anything we in the school committee can do to help, let us know. Great. I don't know if I got any smarter, but I've definitely gotten older. That, that much I know. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, in COVID, uh, I think we age in dog years. So, yeah. No kidding. I just want to say one more thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before we move on, I just want to, I, I also just want to remind us that I, I agree that, that our job is to continuously evaluate and, and move forward as safely as we can. But just again, be mindful that, you know, I think we, we said it at our last meeting, you know, we are still in a pandemic and things can change and day to day and week to week can change. And so as much as we want to give deliberate um, um, guidance and decisions, um, you know, as Annie had pointed out, there may be times when we have to go remote very quickly. There may be times when students aren't able to go to school, then go back. And there may be times when we're kind of shifting between phases based on you know, data and the way our schools are looking and the way the county's looking and whatever not. So just, I, again, I think the intention for all of us is still to move forward, but being mindful that we are kind of at the mercy of whatever else is going on in the town, the, the county, the state, the country. And, you know, we still have to be flexible and move fluidly. That's it, I'll stop. So Annie, is there anything um, else about preparing for Monday, <clears throat> excuse me, preparing for Monday that you wanted to cover here um, in addition to the CDC guidance on close contact? No, just the CDC guidance, which actually aligns with something that Tara just mentioned as well. So the CDC previously defined a close contact as under six, over 15, under six feet, over 15 minutes. Um, now, the CDC in a, in a recent uh, events that occurred at a Vermont correctional facility, the CDC um, and based on transmission that occurred there is defining a close contact as under six over 15 cumulatively over a 24 hour period. So you could have, you could add up over 15 over a 24 hour period. The, um, a close contact is also it, it's very, it's virtually, I would argue, it's really hard to know this um, with, with absolute precision, but also it's two days before symptom onset is the, the time that is the most uh, dangerous to be a close contact of an infected person. It just generally this idea that we went from, not that that was going to be easy in terms of contact tracing, but we just had to keep track of was I within six feet of any person for over 15 minutes in one period of time altogether? And now to think over the last 24 hours, if I add up all the minutes, do they add up to more, 50, more than 15 that I may have been within six feet? What that means in practical terms uh, is that when it comes to contact tracing, that this just becomes a little well, that's an understatement. It becomes more labor intensive. And so I appreciate very much that families are being flexible. I'm going to say that too. We are still technically in a state, we, not technically, we're in a state of emergency for a public health crisis in this state. And we're still in the midst of a pandemic. And as much as I, like everybody else, just want things to be the way they were, they aren't now and they won't be for a while. That doesn't mean they, that we can't operate and we can't have schools uh, open. We just have to be really thoughtful. And we also have to be prepared to be flexible so that when there's a positive case in our district, contact tracing 
because we want to do that well. We do not want to give that um, short shrift, right? That could mean that we're calling, uh, immediately calling for a remote learning day. So I just want families to be prepared, just like we couldn't uh, predict necessarily snow days, the weather did what it was going to do. Uh, if we don't have significant power outage, we don't have to call snow days for snow, we can make those remote learning days and not tack them on to the end of the year. But there may be times that we need to call a remote learning day. And this new revised definition of a close contact and the implications for contact tracing, um, it, it is likely that we would need to call uh, remote learning days in order to make sure that we had thoroughly, carefully, and accurately conducted contact tracing. And that was all with that. Okay, thank you. Um, you also had an update on the after school program. Yes, I'm very sorry to uh, just say publicly the families who were planning on attending have already been informed of this delay in starting our after school program. The issue that we are facing is we are still, we are still maintaining cohorts by grade at the elementary level. And the plan that the school committee saw for Hadley kids had children supervised in zones according to grade level. So it required a staffing minimum that we currently do not have enough people enrolled in the after school program to make that financially feasible at this moment in time. And I also completely understand that if, if I were somebody who was hoping and expecting, anticipating after school to be available on Monday, I would be saying things like, well, that's ridiculous. You put them on the bus. So there are places where children mix. They do currently mix on the bus. They may mix in uh, ex uh, extended day at Hopkins uh, extra help in the afternoon during uh, remote learning period in the afternoon. But we are very careful about when students mix. And if there's another alternative, then we try to do that alternative. So at this point in time, um, I want to make sure that we have done one of two things, um, either, either when more students are, are potentially enrolled in Hadley Kids and uh, we, can, we can provide the program in a financially feasible way, that is one thing. And I certainly, if we could decide at some point that it is not necessary to keep students cohorted by grade, in the after school program, but just like the other conversation, I would want Ms. Frost to have a plan that went before the school committee and that everybody was very clear on what was happening in that building in the afternoon and why. And we're just not there for the 26. So I do apologize to the 16 families whom this affects. It was our goal to have it up and running. That's why we had the plans. Uh, that's why we created the plans and brought them forward. This is not, it's my understanding that there may have been some uh, chatter on social media that it's closed for the year. That it was not the communication. We are delaying the opening of the after school program for the reasons that I just said. Thanks, Annie. All right. Um, before we move into second and final reading of policies, is there anything else um, regarding reopening Monday um, metrics that we want to cover here? Not for me. Okay. I just want to say good luck to everybody. Yeah. It's smooth Monday. Thank you. I, I again just want to thank the staff for working really hard today and thank you to the community for allowing us two days. Um, I know we had recognized early on this week that we needed the time to plan. Um, and I know it was a hardship for some families who have been coming in person to then be remote for two days. Um, but really we were able to take spaces and make sure that we fit enough students in each space so we didn't require the overflow spaces that we 
that we had anticipated that we were going to need. So now we have um, freed up some more staff. We're um, feeling really good about our scheduling. Um, I know we have Michelle Watowitz here, who is one of our teachers who has been um, just helping us rethink spacing. Um, so it's been very um, helpful. And I just wanna say thank you. Michelle, did it, was there anything else I needed to, to speak to? I think you covered it all. Thank you. I okay, think great. teachers are very excited to see many more students on Monday. Thank you. That's great. And I'm sure all of the educators are so excited to see all the kids on Monday. Great. Okay, uh, we're going to move into the second and final reading of the Title IX policies. This is from the policy subcommittee. Yes, and I will say it's second in that this these uh, policies were included in handbooks um, because the law passed on August 14th and it wasn't clear that it was going to the major revisions to Title IX. So it was in the 11th hour that um, that a Supreme Court or Superior Court, a Supreme Court decided to um, decided that these major revisions would occur. Um, we had to because the law took effect on August 14th. We took that language and you did see it in handbooks and you did approve handbooks. However, we wanted to make sure that the policy subcommittee, if they had questions or wanted to make revisions, um, that we brought those to the committee. There were no additional revisions from the policy subcommittee. So what you would be approving tonight is essentially You've already approved it in the handbooks, but this is approving it as school committee policy um, and the policy subcommittee did not recommend any changes. Right, and I think I also see that all of these um, revisions that had taken place earlier were um, per our legal counsel. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. I have no questions of the committee. Were there any questions or clarification? Paul, I can see everybody else's head shaking, but I can't see yours. So you good? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I can't, I can't figure out my camera. Sorry, my No, that's okay. I'm good. Yeah, sorry, Heather. No, no worries. Yamara? I think it's worthy to note that um, the, uh, the the changes are um, are uh, are very different in spirit from what was previously in place, and a couple of things. Um, I I, th I think it just has to be. Uh, uh, some of those highlights just have to be stated. Um, one of those things is um, uh, if if a um, uh, inappropriate activity had has uh, taken place, say on school grounds, uh, that would be covered by Title IX. Mm -hmm. uh, if it takes place on a, a field trip on a, in a foreign land, uh, it is not covered. Um, uh, Another thing that was really surprising to me that was a part of this change in law was uh, that um, uh, if there is a um, something that is reported, um, inappropriate activity um, is reported on uh, an individual, um, now uh, uh, you can sort of cross-examine uh, uh, that individual in um, uh, and there's sort of no protection for the person who's um, who's made the the um, hi girls the uh, uh, accusation or the the claim. There's there's a number of things like that, and I, and I won't get into you know all of it, but um, I would urge you to look at how the law changed. It applies to our workplaces and other such things in our lives um, and will likely um, change again, I imagine, uh, at some point, but um, it's worthy to note that things are not as they were. And just so the community knows, the policy subcommittee discussed this in, in uh, great depth, but as Humara said, so previously, Title IX covers uh, claims, it's part of civil rights, grievances, uh, claims of sexual harassment are included um, under Title IX. And previously there wasn't a stipulation that they had to occur on US soil. So that's there. 
you're th maybe thinking, how does that even apply to Hadley Public Schools? Why would that be different? Of course, we do have students who do field trips overseas, but that does not mean that our code of conduct is not in effect. So we still have a code of conduct. Code of conduct is in effect, um, and students are expected to adhere to our code of conduct, and there would be consequences if somebody in harassment is covered under the code of conduct. But, and, uh, and the and a, uh, victim could not seek recourse under Title IX if it were a field trip that were overseas. Or any event that doesn't happen on school grounds and is not a school event. So allegations of sexual harassment that occur, for example, in an online space or on social media that is not in any way related to some sort of learning classroom or environment, even if both students attend a Hadley Public School, that is not, no longer falls under um, Title IX, a Title IX complaint. But if, if activities outside of school have a substantial and detrimental impact on the learning environment in school, then we can enforce the code of conduct. Um, and certainly we still have our bullying policies and other things in place, but there are, it is a substantial departure from the previous uh, writing of Title IX. I appreciate you guys recapping that for us since we weren't at the table with you all in those uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, it looks like um, you've got a number of uh, policies here that are part of the Title IX policies. Is there a motion to approve um, the uh, revised Title IV, Title IX policies to replace the existing policies A, C, A, B? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Okay. Um, we do have two other action items we'll have in future meetings, our business measure reports and the school committee, um, subcommittee discussions. But uh, for tonight, we do have an uh, action item around nomination official voting delegate to MASC. Um, you've heard us for public, you've heard us talk about MASC uh, previously. It is the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, we are as school committee uh, elected members, members of MASC. They are the, the body that offers um, trainings and uh, lots of uh, support for school committees uh, throughout the state. Things like we've talked about charting the course where we learn about as a school committee member what our um, domain of responsibility does and does not include. Um, they help with uh, uh, all sorts of guidance throughout the year, and they do have an annual meeting every year where that includes um, uh, voting and, and delegates for their assembly. It happens that this year's meeting is online, uh, as is everybody's <laughs> annual meeting pretty much, and it is occurring um, Saturday, November 7th, with uh, essentially wanting to have voting delegate representatives from every district where possible. Um, we have not physically attended an annual meeting for MASC in, in some time, although a while back, I know many of us have attended their charting the course or summer um, uh, educational series that they've offered. I know, Tara, I think you and I went out to a couple of sessions that they held in the state, and they're very informative because you do learn about, you know, even just budget 101, you know, the uh, relationships with the superintendent. Um, uh, ethics and, and policy review, uh, all sorts of really good content. And we learn from other districts that attend since um, you have many districts that are like us and many that are not, that are far uh, larger and just different composition. Um, and so we do, it sounds like we need to have as an action item though, the nomination for the official voting delegate as well as an alternate voting delegate uh, to MASC. So can I nominate? I'd like to nominate Heather as the official delegating uh, uh, voter, if we can. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I accept that nomination. I'm glad to do it and represent uh, Hadley in the meeting. Thank you. Is there a motion? Uh, well, let me ask it as an alternate. 
Uh, is there someone interested as an alternate? I know we do need to have both names. I'm happy to be an alternate. Okay, Humera, I would nominate you as an alternate <laughs> uh, voting delegate to the MASC. I support both of you, that's great. Thanks for stepping forward. Thanks, Paul. Thank you guys. You. I'm looking forward to being able to attend this meeting this year. Um, it's something I've always wanted to do and it's happened during very busy times usually where other conferences are going on too for, for work. So uh, great, so is there- Especially yeah. this year, it should be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I attended the, the two day in-person conference early in my tenure and it was wonderful. A uh, great learning opportunity and I'd love to go back one day. And I think it's going to be so much easier to digest and experience it online, actually. So I'm glad you get to do that, Heather, and so many important things for school committees to discuss this year uh, of all years. Definitely. Um, the keynote event, I know that they have, um, there's a featured presentation from uh, Khalees Warnham uh, from Brookline Public Schools on understanding the connection between cultural proficiency and equity. Uh, and looking forward to being able to see that. Uh, and with it being offered virtually this year, I, um, they, they may have some recordings of sessions that will be available to folks outside of the actual proceedings on the 7th. So really looking forward to that. Great, thank you for sharing whatever you, um, whatever you learn. Um, we would love to hear some of the findings when you come back. I will bring it back to the group on the 19th. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I think you and I are on the same page here, but I have a 500 vote, but I don't have a motion or a second. So for technical reasons, can we just backtrack for a second? I, I've, I motioned to um, to approve Heather, okay. and I think Tara seconded that. Okay. And I motion. Heather nominated me and Paul seconded that. Perfect. Thank you. You You're got welcome. it. All right. Um, that's it for tonight. We have uh, two meetings as we've been talking about. November 19th at 530. And uh, is there a motion to adjourn the regular meeting? I think you all are moving into the policy subcommittee to keep reviewing. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Good luck with policies, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.